Good morning. I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the research that we've been doing uh, recently. Uh, as you might know, we have a, a research program at McKinsey and at the McKinsey Global Institute, which is McKinsey and Company's research arm, looking at data more broadly. Uh, some of you might have read our uh, big data report from just a couple of years ago. But we want to take a, a different cut at things. And, and what we've observed is a, another type or another t cut of data uh, which can actually multiply or accelerate the value that can be created by data. And that really is around open data, when data is made more accessible to more people uh, and therefore can be used uh, more broadly. But before we start uh, on some of the research findings, uh, I want to uh, display a, 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 a big data, open data pioneer. Uh, some of you might recognize this fine gentleman. Does anyone know who this is? Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States. And what did he do back uh, over 200 years ago, 210 years ago about? He did a real estate deal. Right? He bought some land, uh, Louisiana Purchase, right? Not, not a big deal. But also had to do some due diligence on the land. So uh, he sent uh, this guy. Anyone recognize who this is? Captain Meriwether Lewis, right? And uh, his deputy, second lieutenant, uh, uh, William Clark, to go look around. Um, and, you know, it was actually sort of a big data acquisition problem, right? Yeah. He told them to go out there, look at lat latitude, longitude, geology, flora, fauna, collect all that data. That, that, those were their orders, right? So uh, very early days of big data, perhaps, you might say, or at least fine-grained data. But an interesting part of that order that he gave them was, the f was, was a, 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 another part of that order, uh, which he described as follows, right? Your observations are to be taken with great pains and accuracy, to be entered intelligibly for others as well as yourself. And that last phrase we think is incredibly important, for others as well as yourself, because that recognition is that data can be more valuable when it's seen by more people and can be used by more people, when it's made more open and more liquid. And so what we wanted to investigate is what happens when you actually make data more available and more liquid. We've launched this report uh, today, actually. You can download, download it freely off the web. Uh, I'm going to share some of the findings from this report. But the first thing we want to describe is, you know, what do we mean uh, by open data, right? Well, we are talking about data that's becoming more and more open. But you know, one of the other things that we've discovered is that this is a trend, and I think some of you are aware of it. You know, in the intervening 210 years, and we're not saying that Thomas Jefferson invented open or liquid data, we have seen the use of data, the op more open or liquid use of data, become more and more prevalent. And it's a, it's a global phenomenon, right? So over 40 countries around the world have open data portals. In fact, today in the, in the UK, the Open Data Institute uh, held a summit as well, where they also talked about uh, you know, the potential impact of open data. It's not just a national uh, uh, phenomenon. We're seeing state and local governments you know, the, the city of New York here, for instance, uh, as well as is, is involved. And we also believe that this is not just a phenomenon for public sector and government data. We actually take a more expansive view of what it means to, be, to have open data, to have more liquid data. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mean by open or liquid data, because we do think it's more than just government data. We have a four-part definition. The first part of it is you know, just almost what it, what's implied, which is the accessibility of data to more than one entity, more than one organization, more than one person. And, and by the way, we think that of this definition as really being a spectrum. This is not a binary thing where there's open data and you know, data that's just proprietary or closed. So across each of these definitional dimensions, so one of them is accessibility. You can imagine data that's accessible to everybody. You can imagine data that's only purely proprietary but that actually varies along the spectrum. So take, for example, some of the healthcare data that's being made available by the US Health and Human Services Department. Some of that data is only accessible, they've made more accessible by making it available to qualified medical researchers. So that's not data that's available to everyone in the world, and yet it is becoming more open, more available, and we're seeing more value being able to be created from it. The second definitional dimension that we talk about is machine readability. Again. Machines can read pretty much any data, but there is a, a variance between data that's easier to use, right, for our, our data scientists, et cetera. So take, for example, uh, you know, the US Federal Reserve, Reserve Board publishes a tremendous amount of data, but they publish it in PDF. Yes, 
My machine can read PDF, but that's not exactly the, the most convenient way for us to use that data, right? And they're working on it. They're thinking about that. But you know, that, that's a, a challenge to be had. On the other hand, of course, there's other data that's much more easy to read uh, for, for machines and much more easy, much easier to analyze. The third dimension is cost, right? Uh, obviously, some data completely free of cost, free to use. You can download our report. You don't have to pay for it, for instance, right? On the opposite side, you can pay a lot of uh, money for certain types of data. And then finally, rights to use. Again, some data you can gain access to, but it's encumbered by certain, you know, whether or not you can republish it, whether or not you can use it for analysis, whether or not you can distribute, to, just distribute it to others. Again, that's another dimension. And all of these dimensions go into, you know, a, a, a set of spectra in, in terms of how open data can be. One of our observations is that we're seeing more and more data that's becoming more and more open uh, across all these four uh, dimensions of, of openness. And then we're, what we try to do is understand how value can be created from all of them. Of course, you know, we often get this question, you know, how does this relate to big data? We, because we've studied that as well. And here's you know, a, a, a quick, simple, not entirely uh, to scale Venn diagram, right? There's all the data in the world. There's big data, as we've, you know, we can argue about how you want to define that. But there's volume, diversity of sources and types, and increasingly real time. And, and then, of course, there's open data. Data you know, defined as being open against those four criteria I just described. Now, some of that open data is coming from governments. In fact, you know, many times governments are leading in the, in the opening of data, right? So that's definitely true. But you know, one point that we make is we're seeing an increasing amount of data that's becoming more liquid coming from private sector sources as well. And there's other, one other type of data that we also want to include in, because it's often included, uh, and we, we include it in the scope of our research, which we've described as my data. Other people have described it as personal data. But that's when an institution or an organization has data about you and shares it specifically with you. That actually has some really useful value. Sometimes, you know, if it's personal data, I can compare my personal data against uh, others. That can be useful for deciding if I want to change my behavior. But the other value it has for the institution that shared that data with me, often they allow me to you know, correct it. And uh, you know, as a, a, a colleague of mine often says, there's nobody who has more incen incentive to make sure that the data is right than the person about whom the data describes. Right? So you get an automatic, or at least a relatively easy way to increase your data quality if you share data with the entity or person about which it's describing. So that's my data. So with all those things in mind, how do we actually see value being created uh, from open data? First of all, there's just pure transparency. So for instance, price transparency will allow you to create a more competitive environment and just you know, purely save you money. But that actually you f can go on the flip side as well. So if you think about consumer products, if machine-readable data was available about various things, such as its materials or other things that people care about, maybe labor, you know, maybe the pollution associated with you know, manufacturing or designing that product, that actually can, can add value because you, know, you can differentiate based on that. So again, trans transparency can be quite powerful. In fact, the other interesting thing about that is a lot of that value accrues to the consumer uh, f over 50% of the value we, identify, we identified in this research is, is a value that actually gets captured by consumers or customers. Secondly, benchmarking. Simply being able to compare your performance. Let's say you're an oil and gas company and you want to compare your uh, drilling performance against peers. Or for instance, if I have information, uh, you know, my data perhaps, about my own healthcare and can compare it against a population of similar people, I can change my behavior. Benchmarking is extraordinarily powerful. Again, this is often the combination of big data and open data. And again, about a third, and by the way, these are uh, you know, overlapping uh, sources of value. About a third of the value that we discovered from the potential of using open data comes from benchmarking. Also creating new products and services. We've already heard this morning uh, you know, about a company that provided crop insurance to farmers. And it was based on what? <laughs> on open data that came from the government that was about weather, that was about soil. In fact, to a certain extent, it's, it's the natural uh, uh, descendant of data of some of the data we talked about from Lewis and Clark as well. Again, that company was sold for about a billion dollars. The ability to match supply and demand is something that open data can also encourage. So for instance, we've studied a problem we've described as education to employment. Oftentimes students don't know what the job market has, and oftentimes employers don't actually know what employees uh, or potential employees, their skills that they have. Again, open data can help improve that matching and improve the efficiency of markets. Collaboration at scale. 
crowdsourcing doesn't work, particularly for large amounts of data sourcing, unless that data is actually made available. And again, so open data can help improve collaboration at scale. You know, th those of us who are geeks remember the Eric S. Raymond thing about open source, right? Um, you know, with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, right? That's in code. You know, arguably, if you have enough eyeballs on data, all insights are shallow. That's probably not exactly true, right? But again, if you have more eyeballs working on data, you're more likely to get more insights and better analysis. And then finally, increasing the accountability of institutions. You know, that's actually the thing that people probably talk most about when you open up data. And yet, you know, one of what the, our research shows is that not only can you increase the accountability of the institutions we care about, such as governments, but we can actually derive actual economic value. And speaking of economic value, you know, we size this potential. And by the way, this is potential. This is not for backward-looking, but rather forward-looking. And many other things have to happen other than just data becoming more open. But if you look across a number of different domains, from education to transportation, consumer products, oil and gas, electricity, healthcare, uh, consumer finance, we see over a tr $3 trillion on an annual basis can be unlocked through uh, the effective use of open data. So finally, what has to happen in, in order for this value to be captured? Well, a lot of things. This stuff doesn't come for free to a certain extent, although sometimes the data can be free. First of all, identifying and prioritizing uh, and catalyzing the data that needs to be made open. I mean, one of the things that we've observed is sometimes institutions that can make data open make data open that's easiest to open. And that's great, right? I mean, getting quick wins, the ease of uh, implementation is important. But also understanding where that value could be is also important. So understanding value potential and using that as a way uh, to prioritize what the data you're going to open is helpful. And oftentimes, it's good to just ask, right? What is the data that's going to be useful? Secondly, you know, a CEO once stood on a stage like this one and uh, had a famous quote. You might be familiar with it. It, it went viral. Developers, 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 developers. You, you know the quote, I think. <laughs> Look it up if you haven't seen it. Look, just like in software platforms, Having a, a thriving ecosystem of developers is incredibly important in order to create adoption. The exact same thing is true with data. If you're going to make data open, if you're going to make it more liquid, you need to have a set of developers. And you could think of it even as a marketing problem. You need to have awareness. You have, need to have conversion. People actually have to use your data. You need to have loyalty. They need to come back and use your data again. Again, that's part of the trick. It's, this is not a field of dreams type of deal where you can just make data open and they will come. You need to encourage them to come. Thirdly, talent. This is something that we studied a great deal with, with big data. It continues to be true here. Right? Data scientists, still in tremendous demand. I think all of you all know that. But people who can do visualization, people who can tell stories, as important, if not more, with open data. Of course, there are a tremendous number of policy issues that need to be addressed, whether they're privacy, confidentiality, intellectual property, security, et cetera. This is a place where, again, I said that open data is not just about governments, but sometimes governments have a unique role to play in terms of trying to set the rules that make some of these uh, uses of data more safe but also more effective. And it's interesting, government has a dual role here. It can be both a provider of data as well as you know, set the context for value to be captured. And then finally, how do you make data more usable? How do you make it more findable? How do you make data more comparable? Someone is going to have to try to work on platforms. We're going to have to have standards that make data more comparable. At least it makes it easier for our data scientists to do. Of course, they can do some work in the back office. But standards are helpful. Uh, and then finally, having the metadata. How often is data going to be available? You know, what, are its, what is its provenance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, working on some of those problems is incredibly important. But you know, basically, what our, our point of view is, if you have more people working on data, and you have more data available becoming more liquid and more open, it creates a multiplier effect where you can create more value. Thanks very much.